Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. For more information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Uh, man, I've got a great guest today. Just a, just a tremendous guitar player. I'm with um, Ben Yardley from La Chinga. They're great, great stoner rock fuzz rock band blues based hard rock band from canada and he's a super cool guy just a wonderful player man he's one of my favorite players and uh before we get moving i want to thank scott hamilton from um um small stone correct yeah, I had That's a brain right. fart That's there for it. setting this yeah. up. Uh, so Ben grew up on the rural island off the west coast of Canada. His parents were from England. He's been married for 10 years. He's got three kids. He got into music originally through going through his dad's record collection, Beatles, Bob Dylan, started playing guitar when he was 14, mostly because of Led Zeppelin and Van Halen, and he started playing in bands seriously when he was around 18. He formed La Chinga five years ago. They've got three albums, La Chinga, Freewheeling, and most recently, Beyond the Sky. They've toured Europe twice. They're going back to Europe this spring. And Ben is also playing South by Southwest this spring as well. He's a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and we'll talk with him about what his journey's been like later on. Band is headquartered out of Vancouver. They won the Vancouver Band of the Year Award in 2013, and very deservedly so. He's also the co-writer of one of my like absolute all-time favorite songs in the history of music called Dawn of Man, which is from their second album in 2016 called Freewheeling. It's like, to me, that song represents everything that's holy when it comes to rock and roll, and I would love you to check it out. It's called Dawn of Man from the second album of, from La Chinga. Uh, and the name of the album is Freewheeling. And um, I was talking to Ben before we got started. And I, I told him, I said, man, to me, this is the kind of song every band lives to have just one of. But unfortunately, most don't get. So, man, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, man. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, so La Chinga has been together five years. And so how did you, Carl Spackle, the bass player, and Jason Solium, is that his name? Yeah. Solium. Yeah. Solium. Uh, Solium on drums first connect and what were you guys doing what were you doing musically before that okay well it's um now i've known those i've known but we've known each other for years right um and uh like me and jay in particular i think i've known that guy for 20 years or so <laughs> and really carl cool. say, same thing like we've all been around and we've known each other and, and jammed and played in bands together and on and off for years and uh it was just kind of, it was kind of random. Like at the, at, at the first Lachinga show that we played, um, uh, Carl had a gig. He had this gig that was booked at this sort of, uh, it was like a party at this weird house. that's sort of like a commune, um, sort of out in the sort of rural outside of the city here. And, uh, it was a totally awesome gig. And, and I think like he was playing with a couple of other guys that weren't around but he didn't want to say no to the gig because he was like totally into playing it and committed to it and stuff. So he asked me and Jay to do it. And, uh, and we were both kind of into it. And, and so we, we jammed a couple times and went and played the show. And, um, and, and so that's, that's kind of how it started. It was totally random. And uh, me personally, at the time I had already kind of been in a bunch of bands and toured and really tried hard to like, you know, make it somewhere with music. And I just kept on hitting roadblocks and I, I was sort of frustrated with it. And I kind of, kind of given up in a lot of ways, you know, like I still loved it and I still play guitar and stuff, but I wasn't interested in like putting a band together and putting effort into something like that. I was like, whatever, but, um, but we jammed and, you know, the thing about it is it, and, you know, is that it was like, I can, I can honestly say that like as a musical experience, it was the first time I ever had a band where it was like instantly there was like this thing, there was a vibe and it was just kind of, it just really was like happening by itself. And not, neither of them had any kind of discussion about what we were going to do or what it was going to sound like, or like you play like this and I'll play like that. It was just kind of like, it, we just started playing and that's kind of been the, the way it's been ever since, you know? Very cool. Um, which feels great. 
Yeah, very cool. Even even the name, right? We had a song called Lachinga. We didn't have a band name. We played the song. And then people just started yelling, hey, Luchinga, like started yelling it at us. And we were like, well, I guess I guess that's what we'll call the band. It's funny, like when you're doing the intro and you're saying, you know, they've done this, like Luchinga's done this and we've done that and all that kind of stuff. It is it is sort of it, it kind of it kind of seems surreal. It's sort of like, have we? And I guess, oh, yeah, we totally have, you know, yeah. um, but it's been it's been like very natural and, and like a like and like without you know sounding too misty eye like a total gift you know what i mean yeah like yeah sure of, it just totally happened by itself without any kind of effort yeah know? but don't you find I've, uh that over your life the things that sort of happen that you don't have to kill you i mean you got to always work hard but yes the things that sort of fall yeah. together organically those are the like you oh know, yeah most peaceful totally. things and most productive yeah yeah it's the things that those are the things that like um you know, it's like they, they, they kind of, they happen totally naturally. And there's all sorts of, you know, sort of, uh, things in life that, you know, where, where you have to put in a lot of effort and, and certainly with the band, I mean, you know, the genesis of it was like that, but there's been effort and struggle. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? It's yeah. been like, how do we pay for this and how do we get this together? And like it, that kind of stuff, but the actual like creative side of it and the sort of the energy when we play yeah. together, that's always just like a natural, like, gift right totally talk about i I asked you this when we first initially spoke to set this up tell my listeners what la chinga means because it's kind of cool yeah so it's um uh, the uh, okay so our first meaning of it i guess is um it it translates literally into the fuck um (laughs) but but you know but it's um it's that's right buddy i know it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is classic, man. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh, that's classic. That's like yeah. that's like the most classic moment that I've had in about in out of four hundred and something interviews. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He, well, you know, little kids. So for you out there that are listening, I've got my little <laughs> two year old son beside me right now, and and he doesn't know how to speak words, but he understands pretty much everything, right? So yeah. a- anyway. So that's the literal translation. And then it's like slang that's used in Mexico. And it basically is like uh, something that you say. um, It would be like an exclamation, like when something awesome is about to happen, you know, like. um, Like, yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, like, all right. Like, you know, you're excited about something. The um, the, the sort of most obvious example that is used in pop culture is in the Cheech and Chong movie Up in Smoke. Mm. Um, where uh, where they first meet, where Chong picks up Cheech and he's hitchhiking, and then Tommy Chong pulls out like a giant joint, and Cheech goes, "Oh, la chinga!" Like that, <laughs> he's super excited about the joint. Um, so that's what it means. But you know, in the course of the band, we've had different people from other, um, you know, Central American and sort of Hispanic and Latin countries that say, "Yeah, in you know, in Colombia, it's slang uh, for naked woman." Um, okay. and I've heard sort of different, you know, sort of different meanings. Um, but they're all really positive. <laughs> all yeah. Really right, positive, right. You know what I mean? So it's just so, a cool, a cool Spanish expression, yeah, basically. It is. Yeah. And, and it's also like, you know, coming up with band names is always like, I don't know if you've ever done this in bands before, but sometimes it can be like, Oh God, like you, you spend months sort of like thinking and hashing out. And, and so this one was like, again, like the rest of the band, it just totally like happened for us. People said, Oh, that's the name of your band. Hey, Luchinga, like people just started yelling it at us. And I'm like, okay, that's good enough. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it is cool. I do think it's a super cool and very cool. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there a, uh, is there a big stoner or heavy blues rock scene in Vancouver? Um, yes, there, yes, I would say there is. Yeah, there, there is, there's lots of, um, there's lots of bands. Um, let's see, there's a band called black wizard in town, uh, that are, that are, quite well known and they're stoner and they've been doing it for a long time uh there's a band named mendoza that had been doing hey stoner doom for a long time uh what else is there there's a new band called killer deal which is sort of like blues rock and um but yeah no it's totally popular like there's there's uh big shows and local bands and uh but i found that um I found that it's become a, like a popular thing globally, it seems, over the last few years. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. I know. I know. You can't touch the phone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure because I wasn't really like, um, you know, when I was younger, I was aware of some of the bands like Monster Magnet and stuff. I've always been a fan of, but I was never really heavy into like a sort of the stoner scene when I was mm. younger, when it sort of first came you know, sort of started to sort of evolve in the nineties. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe it's just that I've become more aware of it, but it seems to me like it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. It's underground music, but it's like, yeah. there's a big audience for it nowadays. There is and a big buzz. And, and globally, right. It's totally. like all over the place. There's big bands and big shows and there's an audience for it, which is awesome. Huge audience actually. Yeah. It's funny. I yeah. interviewed Ed Mundell from monster magnet. Oh yeah. Awesome. yeah. It was a, awesome. uh, it was a funny interview. Real good yeah. interview actually. Yeah, cool. How'd you guys get hooked up with Small Stone? Because I think uh, you were on a different label earlier on, I think, right? Well, the first record we made, we just released it ourselves, right? I just like, we, we recorded it. Jay, uh, our drummer, is a uh, super talented um, producer, rec- recording engineer, and has a home studio. And so he actually, our first two records, and a lot of our third record, he did all the recording of. Um and so we, we kind of, we started, uh, you know, making demos and those demos just turned into the first record. And then we were like, well, let's just, we're just going to put out a record. We're going to press 300 copies of it on vinyl and we're going to put it out ourselves. And, um, and, uh, which was, which totally like, um, spun into a bunch of other stuff. Right. And that's it's small stone. Scott just contacted us like, on the internet one day he's and it was basically like hey i listened to your record i dig your band would you like to make a record for us and that's oh that's, that's very kind of cool record. yeah i'm not sure how he how it came up on his radar but but it did somehow um and the same thing with the first time we toured europe it was it was for that record which you did independently and it was a guy over there in barcelona his name is um mark rockenberg and he's got a record label over there and sort of a, touring company which he was which he was just starting at the time and he heard the record somehow and he's like you guys ever want to come to europe and of course we're like yeah we do <laughs> yeah. that's very cool of course we do right so you know again it's sort of like these you know we just sort of like you know put it out there into the world and it's like all this like great stuff sort of started coming back to us from it that's awesome. great man very yeah cool. yeah totally so did you grow up in vancouver where'd you grow up well, I was uh, I was born in Vancouver, and then I I grew up on this in this island, which is off the coast here in Canada, called Salt Spring Island. Um, and uh, what can I say about Salt Spring Island? It's yeah. tiny. Like, there's maybe when I was growing up, there was maybe three thousand people that lived there. Holy and crap! It's, yeah, so it's wow. tiny and and kind of isolated, and it's um, it's sort of like there's two there was two cultures on the island. One was like complete like hippie, hippiedom. You know, people had moved there to sort of uh, escape society and grow fields of weed and just like do whatever the hell they wanted. And then, and then just like backwoods, like redneck types that had been there for generations and farm sheep and drove muscle cars and like that. that kind of wow. Shit. Yeah. So, it, and it was very, very much backwater, but very sort of like uh, interesting culturally. Right. So like, there was always like a heavy interest in music and drugs there. And, and like, um, yeah, it was, it's a, it was a, a really a great place to grow up as a little kid. Uh, just so I, cause there's so much nature and freedom and that kind of stuff. But you had to do, I, I would imagine to go from that to marry three kids running a business. Yeah. Like there had to be some adjustment involved there. Cause that's like not, Though, you know that's not congruent with hippie slash redneck no you know you know the thing is the thing is with me is by the time i kind of reached uh my teenage years like i just couldn't wait to get out of there okay i wanted like i was you know i was really i'd become really into rock music and punk rock and like all sorts of different stuff in that regard and it was like i didn't want to be i wanted to be in a city you know what i mean i wanted yeah. to be able to go to shows and buy records and like be around people and so so i moved i moved in i moved to vancouver started living here probably when i was like 18 or 19 i think that's cool man i give you a lot of credit for that that's tough to sort of make an adjustment like that i think yeah yeah i mean it was you know it it was but it but it was you know it was the right thing for me to do you know i still love salt spring i go back there and visit whenever i can oh your um, your folks are your folks still there uh not anymore my yeah. sister still lives there mm-hmm. um 
and I have like, you know, I have a lot of roots there, hmm. uh, but I, I couldn't live, I couldn't live in a place like that at the moment. Um, yeah. No, I yeah. totally get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what was growing up there like? What was like, what was your childhood like? Was it? Like, oh, you know, it was actually like, it was really, really cool is what it was like because it was, um, you know, it was, I mean, maybe this is like a typical of kids in that era, but it was sort of like, we got put on our bicycles in the morning basically. And like, yeah. okay, off you go. You know, and we would yeah. basically just like take off all day and build forts in the woods and bike around and go swimming. And like, it was, it's, it was beautiful, right? It was beautiful as a little kid. And it, it's a, yeah, it was wonderful that way. I wouldn't imagine on a place like that, that's so contained, there was probably any crime. No, not really. Yeah, no, if there was really some cool. kind of like a like a break in or like that kind of stuff, it's basically like everybody knew about it and everybody everybody would know who did it more. Yeah, or less, yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? like, That's what I figured. Like if there was some kind, of, if there was like a car accident, it was big news. You mm. know? Yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of idyllic in a sense. It, it 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 was. It really was. Yeah. What kind of work did your folks do? Well, my mom was a nurse. So she got a job. There's a small hospital on the island. She worked there. And my dad was an architect. And uh, he, for a long time, he commuted into Vancouver. And then he, uh, and, but then he ended up having his own business over there. And he did houses over there and stuff. Well, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 When you first started playing, were you drawn to blues as a player? Um, you know what? There was, uh, yeah, I, I, I really was actually. Um, one of my first memories of, uh, like when I started playing guitar of like having a moment where I was like, oh, I, I kind of understand what to do here is I had a guitar teacher over there on salt spring when I was a, you know, an adolescent and he was sort of like, uh, he was playing like an a bar chord and he was sort of like, you know, if I play here, like, and you wanted to play like a sort of a lead over it, what do you think you, you would do? I kind of intuitively knew, like, so, could see some of the, like, the sort of box pattern on, like, the fifth fret of, like, pentatonic stuff. Because yeah. I think I've probably been watching, like, you know, like, the song remains the same. And I watched Jimmy Page and I kind of was like, oh, I see if you're playing, like, in this area, you kind of move your hands. So in this kind of way, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I could, you know, sort of, like, see the, you know, physically what you do with your hands if you wanted to play something that sounded right. So... I kind of got that. And then he made a cassette, which had like a blues, like a 12 bar blues progression. And he showed me the sort of root pentatonic scale. Right. And, and, uh, and I would play that tape and I would like play like a blues solo over that thing. And I remember it like being like, it, it seemed like super like intuitive to me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I was like, Oh yeah, that totally makes sense. That goes there. And like, I mean, probably cause I listened to, I've been listening, you know, unknowingly to me, like, a, like so much blues based music, right? Mm. Like any kind of classic rock that you listen to, like 90% of like rock music is based in that comes from that world. Yeah, right? so, for sure. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. In your bio, you mentioned mm. that you were in recovery. And so first mm -hmm. of all, man, huge congratulations to you for that. I know oh, yeah, it's yeah. not easy. And I've had a lot of guys come here and talk about getting sober. And I know a lot of people in my life. And it's amazing that, uh, it's really funny when, um, not funny. It's it's interesting when you talk. You can't talk with someone about getting sober or using drugs that isn't doesn't understand. Like, you know, the the average person thinks it's like, oh man, you just got no willpower, and it's always yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a different thing, man. You know, and. Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, because I've had some of that shit in my family, and it's and like you right. talk to people, and they're it, it they they don't get you know they don't get it that it's freaking illness, man. You know, yeah. Um, I, so really, man, congratulations to you for getting sober. Um, if you're if you're yeah, comfortable thanks. talking about yeah. it, when how long have you been sober now, and, and like what was your journey? Oh yeah, I've been I've been sober for almost eighteen years. So I got I oh, got sober wow. when I was really young. Uh, That's but, great, you know, man. Yeah, it's totally great. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just sort of give you the, the like the short, the condensed, version, <laughs> condensed cliff version notes version. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I got, I got stoned for the first time, maybe when I was 13 years old, it's my first memory of using a drug. Um, and like I was saying where I grew up, it was a very liberal mm. hippie kind of community. So there was lots of weed around. It was not considered like a bad thing for people to do. Sure. 
Um, and I, I don't, to this day, I don't consider it a bad thing. <laughs> Um, What's that? You broke but, up for a second. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't. And to be clear, like I don't think of dr- I don't think of drugs and alcohol as like evil things or bad things at all. But they're just not for me. It's not a good idea. Yeah, That's yeah. All. Yeah, I remember the first time I got stoned, and I remember thinking, like, man, this is like the best thing that I've ever felt. It's kind of how <laughs> it felt, right? And then, and um, you know, and and looking back in it, I sort of understand that I was like you know, why did that feel so good? And it's because like in my natural state, I didn't feel comfortable. You know what I mean? I felt uncomfortable just being myself or whatever, however you want to put it. And then, and then eventually like, uh, you know, all through my teens and my early twenties, like I was always about, uh, uh, you know, using drugs and drinking and stuff. And, and by the time I reached my mid twenties, it was like, I was a heroin addict and I could, couldn't keep anything together. Wow. Like I, I, I kind of like lost lost everything didn't have a place to live like um things got very very bleak and uh you know and i'd been to like treatment centers and stuff like i've been a few times and none of it had really clicked and uh you know i just you know it it reached a point it's what happens if you're lucky really is you, you hit a bottom for me i hit a bottom and i realized that like I couldn't use any of those things safely, you know, mm. without it destroying my life. And I couldn't look for um, drugs or alcohol as a solution to my problem or a release or anything. They didn't offer me anything except, except fucking pain. Basically. Yeah. Right. And so I really understood that, um, like in my core, I guess I was 26, maybe 25, something like that. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, and that was, 2001 yeah yeah 2001 and um and then and and you know i've been clean and sober ever since right and uh um you know and, and it's sort of been um i mean I, I have no desire to ever go back to what i was doing and the sort of gifts that i've gotten out of being sober are just like i can't even begin to you know quantify it really you know what i mean yeah. my life compared to being how I was living back then and how I felt about myself in the world. Like it's, it's, I have, I've had a, like a complete like change in my attitude and mentality about everything as a result of that. Right. As a result wow. of getting sober. And, um, you know, and I, and I kind of understand today that it's sort of like, I have like, you know, there's so many things in my life, yeah. you know, what I mean? that, that are like so amazing. And it's, it's all because I don't, do that anymore yeah, <laughs> you know right. what i mean and i choose a different way of living right thank you and uh, c- congrats thank you for sharing that and congratulations yeah. i'm really happy for you man yeah 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 it's um yeah it's a, i'm really ha- i'm really happy for me you yeah know? Man. yeah yeah i feel i feel super grateful about it and it's funny because it's been so long like i don't i don't often think about it but when i do you know what i mean i'm like yeah like it's really like my life has become totally amazing since that day that I decided to put everything down. You know, it's like the trajectory just totally changed directions because of that. Did you go to like rehab or did you just enter a pro? uh, Did you start going to 12 step or combination? Oh yeah. No, I I went to, I went to several different treatment centers. Um, Most of it just like was in one ear out the other. Sure. Um, And then eventually like I was just in so much pain that I was willing to listen and, uh, and yeah, I, I do 12 step yeah. uh, recovery. So I, it's a, I go to a, I go to a meeting, sure. have, have a sponsor, like do the whole thing. Very cool. And I still, I still do that today and it's, um, yeah, I love it. It's totally That's... amazing. Save my, save my life, you know, really. Man, I'm so happy to hear that, man. I really mm-hmm. am. It's interesting yeah. when you said uh, about that was no longer using was no longer a solution. I know somebody who got sober one time and they said, they, the way they put it, they said, you know, you start using drugs because there's something going on you can't cope, and that's the solution to your problem. And yeah. then this, and then your new problem becomes the, the solution become the, the the solution quote to your problem now becomes your new problem. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah totally. Was, uh, how you totally. It, that's that's yeah, that, and that's how it happens. You know, I mean those yeah. kind of chemicals, right? I mean, we've all sort of experienced them, I guess, and it's like they are. They, they do work for a while. It does work for a while. But that's really like I had to identify my real problem is that my real problem is or was that yeah. uh, like I just did not feel good 
when I was, you know, like just unintoxicated, just like, just me. Like I never really, like, I didn't feel comfortable in just my natural state. Right. Mm. And that's, that's a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's, the, that's what I needed to work on, you know? So well, anyway. man, thank you again. I'm really happy for yeah. you, man. Very, yeah, yeah. very, very cool. Great story, man. And I'm real happy yeah, to hear that. Is. And I think, uh, and I think it's important to discuss this because I know there are people out there that are not oh, there yeah. yet, so, you know? Yeah, so no, thank I'm, you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it's all about, right? It's sort of like I never, you know, when I got sober, it's like I heard, you know, there was, uh, I heard people talk and I was very cynical. So a lot of the times I didn't believe it, but there were some people that I heard and I was like, okay, like I can totally relate to you. And like, if it's possible for you, then maybe it's possible for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Man. yeah. Hey, is there anything like at, at, outside of the drug thing, probably, is there any advice that you would have like to that you'd give young ben if assuming you were willing to listen that would have made your life easier either musically uh anything professionally business career relationship anything oh um god there's <laughs> so many <laughs> i feel you <laughs> it's the the faces song right i wish that i knew what i knew what i knew now when i was younger right i mean that's yeah man. Great chorus, that's right? a great song yeah so yeah i mean i I do my best to live with no regrets. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's sort of like, I kind of adopt, I adopt a view that it's sort of like, well, uh, yeah, I made tons of mistakes when I was a kid and I wish it'd be an X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know if I necessarily believe in mistakes so much anymore. Sure. I just don't, I just don't want to look, I don't look at it that way anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. certainly I, I would. Okay. So if I was going to give myself advice about music, um, there was a period in my life where I was really concerned about like making a living in music. Like that was really the focus. And I wanted to put together bands that were going to get signed. And it was, that was when there was, was such a thing as record deals and yeah. money and stuff yeah. in the music business. Right. It was sort of like, and I, and I made that a goal um, with uh, certain projects that I did in the past. And it really kind of, took the fun and the joy out of it ultimately, you know, Interesting, yeah. because I was looking at it at looking at art and music as a, as a means to an end, you know, it's a stepping stone to get somewhere. Um, and that's a mistake, you know? So maybe that would, that would be advice I would give my young self is just like, just, it sounds like a cliche, but just like concentrate on the music, man. <laughs> no, know? make art for the sake of the joy of, yeah. and then if totally, money comes totally. great, but yeah. Yes. And, and it's also, it's also one of those paradoxes that it's sort of like, if, uh, you know, for me, it's like, if I'm focused on what I'm doing in the moment, i.e. being creative, making a song, playing a show, whatever it is around music, then it's like the chances of it actually being like successful, you know, are much higher than if I'm looking at it as a stepping stone or a means to an end, or what am I going to get out of this, you know? So just a, a shift in mentality, right? I right. would say. Yeah. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. Hey, hey, I want to talk about some guitar stuff, but before we do, I just want to ask you yeah. a question about some of my uh, favorite La Chinga songs. Sure. Let's go. Let's go back to the Donna Man again. Everybody okay. needs to listen to that song. It's from La Chinga's <laughs> second album. It's just like epic, man. It's like yeah. boom. We know? really went for it. We really went for it. You know, <laughs> you yeah. did it, man. Um, yeah. You use a lot of wah on there, and there's also uh -huh. some really cool spacey effects. And then, like we talked about yeah. earlier, the cool voices in the middle of the song. Um, yeah. Like when I listen to it, it, it's almost like in my mind, I'm seeing you walk in there, like into a room, just look around, and then start like talking. I, I was just curious where all the, all the, where did that nutty <laughs> shit come from? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's, uh, that's Carl, the singer, and Jay, like, uh, I think, you know, like, I re when we recorded that, I think I did some of my parts, and then I went home, and they stayed up late and got weird, basically. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's, I think there's a bit of, um, um, another, bit another of, alcohol related incident. Oh, you know, maybe. Yeah. Somebody might have, may or may not have been stoned when they did that. I yeah. Know, I can't can't say for sure sure um it, <laughs> there's a bit of uh it kind of reminds me of there's an alice cooper band song i think it's a ballad of dwight 
Well, it's Dwight Fry. Yeah, I know. that's right. A great that's song, right. man. That's an awesome song. Yeah, that's song. right. Yeah. And and it's kind of I think there's yeah. a bit of that. There's a bit of a tribute to that at the end where he's kind of like, "Let me out of here!" Like, yeah, yeah. Charles like kind of screaming, and he's like the man. Like, you know, I think I was telling you before about how. It, oh, look what's going on here. Um, about how. It, hey, buddy. How it, <laughs> it's a real family affair. There um, you go, man. How how it's sort of like. Uh, you know, the caveman that gets abducted by the aliens, you know, and he's sort of like, he does, he's trapped in the UFO and he's like, let me out of here or whatever. Yeah. So there's yeah. that going on. Um, guitar wise. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a while since I did that track, but I think it's mostly a strat and a lot of wah and, uh, like a univibe. I used a univibe on it to get the, and some echo and stuff to make it sort of, it's sort of spacey and, Psych, psych as possible you know what um what why are you using if you remember um on that one i think i was using a i i think at that point i like i'm just like a little like caveat like i'm a like a gear feed right so i, I don't even know how many watts i own at the moment <laughs> but it's like somewhere between five and ten but anyway i think i was using a custom audio electronics it's either that mm. or i have a or I have a vintage uh, uh, gen, like a '60s gen crybaby. Maybe it's that one. I kind of I use that. I probably use that old one a lot for recording, which is really like it just has a, well, it is the classic sound. Oh, right? it sounds cool. freaking great, dude. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Yeah. So you're playing your Strat. Do you remember what amp yeah. you're playing on that? Um, it is probably it's going to be a it's a Marshall Plexi. Really, like a legit seventies plexi? Uh, I think it's a no. It's a reissue. It okay. is a reissue. It's a yeah. It's a, and that, it's probably been my main amp for like since I was a like it was the first really big amp that I bought maybe when I was nineteen. Yeah. Uh, when they first started reissuing those in the nineties at some point, and um, and I still got it, and it's still probably my my main go to amp. And I don't know if you're a Marshall guy. Uh, to me it's like that is that is the b sound yeah. exam, you know it's like the other ones there's some other really cool marshals but that's the one yeah you know? the plexis yeah. are great man it's just yeah amazing it's just amazing, amazing sound yeah um then you got a track called black river mm -hmm. great rock anthem killer blues yep. solo on that track um do you usually work their solos out prior to going in the studio or, or is it like random whatever comes out it's almost always random. I'll, I'll be like, uh, you know, we'll do like so uh, takes for the solo and I'll be like, okay, let's, uh, let's, and I'll roll it maybe a few times mm -hmm. and run through it. And then eventually like, you know, pretty quick, I'll get a, get a vibe of like, okay, this is a sort of tone. This is the attack and stuff. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's almost all improvised. I don't, I don't, I tend to not like write melodies and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just kind of like, go for it and see what happens in the moment, you know? Do you ever have to, do you find like when you do that, then when you go out on and play them, do you like have to, do you do the same thing or, you know, cause people are sometimes expecting something. I see. Do you have to like go back and listen to the, the song? Yeah, sometimes, and say, sometimes, you know, uh, there'll be certain, like in, if I do a recording and there'll be certain like parts of the solo and I'm like, Oh, that's really like a sort of signature part of the solo. Then I'll, probably keep that when i play it live you okay. know yeah um but i'm still i still kind of have a i really have that sort of mentality with solos anyway that it's sort of like uh it's just like improvisation i guess it comes from being a fan of bands like uh cream or led zeppelin or whatever when you hear them live you know yeah um they, they tend to be like uh they just like really just let go and just do what they feel in the moment which i which i really kind of dig you know Oh, very much. Yeah. And then um, you have a song on Beyond the Sky also called uh, Keep on Rolling. You got some great yep. clean tones in there. Um, yeah. Great blues, but there's a, like a departure from some of the overdriven or the fuzzier stuff. I was curious That's if you're right. playing the same guitar on there, the same Strat, or are you playing something else? Uh, you know, that, okay, so that is, um, no, there's a, there's two different guitars on that. One is a Gibson, um, it's an, it's called the, what is it? It's an EDS 1275, which is the, it's the double neck. It's like the Jimmy Page oh, double wow. neck. Oh, wow. Which, uh, which I, uh, it's a funny story. 
because uh, like Carl was always like, we got to get one of those in the band, right? <laughs> like, it's like no one plays them. They're so cool. And we've been talking about it for a while. And I went to the local guitar shop and there was one sitting in there. And there was no, you know, like a like a legit Gibson one, like the real deal. And, I, and there was no price tag on it. So I asked one of the guys, I was like, how much is this guitar? And he's like, it's like, you know, six grand or something. I'm like, OK, well, forget it. Um, and then I was and then I was back in there. This is peace. Back in the same in the same store, like uh, like a few days later. And there was a tag on it. and It was twenty nine hundred dollars. And I was like. Okay, like if that's real, like I'm gonna have to buy it. But of course, I didn't have twenty nine hundred dollars. So Carl had a um, he had a Les Paul special that was basically sitting in my garage that he never played and had been sitting in there for like two years. And I was <laughs> I was like, dude, how do you feel about me taking your guitar and part trading it? I'll pay for half. We trade your guitar for half, and we get that double neck in the band. And he's like, okay. And so wow, I that was really it. cool. Yeah, yeah, it is super cool. That's very just, like, uh, very cool band like shit. Yeah, to- totally right. And so it's a, it's a, it's a great giant boat anchor of a thing, right? And it's like it's super um, awesome sounding. And uh, I, I do use it live sometimes, but it's a huge commitment. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's sort of like I pull it out for a couple songs, and it's a super awesome dramatic kind of prop. Anyway, so that's what I use for all the clean stuff, and that's going through an AC30, Vox AC30, uh, which is a super rad amp for that kind of thing. And then all the um, loud guitars, the heavier guitars in that, are the Plexi, and it's a Les Paul Jr. Oh, wow. uh, Which I bought, which I actually use for most of the uh, Beyond the Sky belongs to my next door neighbor who's a like a total as it would happen is a total vintage guitar guy rad dude named dave gen total like music legend here in canada Very and cool. he's got like this incredible vintage guitar collection and we're na- <laughs> it turns out we're neighbors and uh and so he bought all these guitars for me to play on the record and that was mostly it's a 1957 les paul jr wow it's just was like honestly man like I had all my guitars and we would try all the different guitars and that one just like kicked the shit out of all of them. It was, it's so beefy and powerful sounding, man. It was like, it's an amazing, they're amazing guitars. Those, uh, those old juniors. Hey man, cool. two words, yeah. Leslie West. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like how you big know? is that sound? Right. One big pickup, big one sound. pickup, one pickup. It's crazy, isn't it? I know. Right. I know. But it's sort of like, it's a total, it's that lesson in less is more, right? It's like there's nothing in the way of that. It's just the sledgehammer of that P90 pickup, chunk of mahogany, and it's like, fuck, they're so badass, man. That guitar is so cool. Dude, you're anyway. like a you, – if you bring out that – the Les Paul Jr. and that double neck, you're just like – that's yeah. like a, the biggest swinging cool. guitar dick for the night anybody's gonna have it's like guitar nerd <laughs> heaven right? yeah it's like but it's like that's what i'm I, i'm all about it right like i i just love that i love uh um you know there's certain players like if you ever go and see cheap trick live you know and uh rick nielsen yeah. like he it's like a different crazy awesome guitar for every song right? yeah and if you're a guitar guy it's just like it's like heaven you know super cool a lot of bands that play up there um you know yeah you do you can see you can see most things there are a few different acts that you know the border gets a little scary and they don't come up hmm. you know uh but yeah yeah you can see you can see a lot of stuff Ki- right. i mean kiss just uh kiss was in town for like two weeks because they just started their farewell tour or whatever so they rented one that of cracks me up right the farewell know, tour fucking, it's like their yeah, it's fucking like seventh shit. farewell tour i know totally it's like yeah whatever farewell until you fucking need another 50 million bucks and then yeah. it'll be farewell again in five years or yep. whatever but anyway they, they were here um, and they rented uh one of the local uh arenas to like practice and set up their stage show and then they had the first show of their tour and actually vancouver is kind of weird that way because it's been used for that by a lot of different bands over the uh, like dating i don't know i don't know why that is but like to um, kick off tours yeah like people like you too came here like two years ago and did the same thing rented a stadium for a month and set up their stage rig and practice Dude, yes, you know how much yes. money you have a month oh, fuck. 
Yes, no, I know. It's crazy. They didn't right? rent they like rent, the, the Shriners they rent, Hall. They rented the no, stadium. No, they rent from... like a 16,000 seat hockey arena, right? And spend like a month rehearsing their stage show in there. And Holy then they play their, play their first show of the tour here and then, and then take off on tour. But um, wow. Vancouver's kind of funny that way uh, as a music city because there's not really a lot of uh, famous or good bands over the years that have come from here, really, in my opinion, right? Um, there's some great music that's come out of here, but as a, as a, like a music industry place, like the studio scene here and stuff, it's like, it's crazy. Hmm. There's uh, you know, especially, I mean, during the eighties hair metal era, for example, there was little mountain sound, which, um, was Bob Rock's kind of, uh, place that he worked out of. And it was oh, like, that. yeah. And it was sort of like everybody in that era, like Aerosmith, Motley Crue, David Lee Roth, like. ACDC, they all were, would come here to record their fucking huge rock records. I didn't know. That's really cool. Yeah. So it was him and uh, Bruce Fairbain is another guy. Who yeah, I remember that name. A- yeah, ACDC, Bob Clear Mountain. Um, you know, like they, these guys, I mean, that were just like like top of the game at that period, mm. right? And so they would work out of here. And so a lot of those bands would come here to re- uh, record and then it also became, for some reason, I, maybe that's the reason why they would come here to like set up and, and uh, start their tours, right? They would come here to like do all their staging and then practice and start the tour here or something. So that's interesting. It's funny we're yeah. like so ethnocentric in the states here. Like yeah. we don't, you know, we have blinders on pretty much because the states are so. I think it's because I don't know that it's. I'd like to think it's not ignorance, although probably some of it is. But I think part of it is because the states are so big. Like yeah. Canada is, but you know, yeah. um, there and there's not a lot of you know, you have like pockets of places where there's people from all over. Like, I grew up yes. in New York City, which was obviously one of them, but yeah. y- you know, um, people we sort of go about our merry way thinking the you know, they're, yeah. we're not aware that the rest of the world is actually stuff going on there. It's like, sure, yeah, yeah, sure, you know, so yeah. People say that about the states all the time. Yeah, it's I mean, true. It, it's it's a fair criticism, but at the same time, it's not anyone's fault. It's just sort of like people are focused on their daily lives and what's going on around them, and right. it's, that's that's cool, you know. Uh, I, but yeah, I, yeah. Well, I also think travel is not because of it's the states. It's so big. Like my wife is from the UK. You know, she was she went to Italy when she was a kid. She went to Spain. Oh, yeah. it, it's a tiny place. It's normal. You go all these places in the states. It's that's like you true. know. Yeah, you, you can go to another state maybe i don't know it's just travel is not as encouraged i think yeah no that is that is totally true that is totally true and it's it's sort of like when you travel like i don't know maybe it's like if you're in the states like we go on holiday you go to like hawaii you go to another okay. part of florida country. hawaii yeah. california you know it's you know yeah. like you're not going to say hey man let me go to uh nebraska for a week that's just probably like not going to fucking happen, <laughs> not, man. Nothing not like against Nebraska, happen. but it just doesn't happen. I don't know. You no, know. no, no, totally yeah. not. Totally not. Yeah. Um, guitars, man. What's your primary go-to guitar and what other two would round out your top three? Oh, wow. Well, this is a fun question. I love talking about this. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you right now, my wife the other day asked me how many guitars <laughs> how many guitars do you have anyway? And I honestly, I don't, I don't know. That's great. <laughs> it's some, it's probably around 30. I think it's under 30, but I might be. Wow. Not. That's a healthy so, collection. So, oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm fully like, I, you know, I sort of tried to keep it under control for a while, but now it's just sort of like, I let the, you know, <laughs> I can let the bull run wild. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> if I see something that I want or that I really like and I can afford to do it, I generally just buy it now. It's Good for you, do. man. Yeah. And then if, you know, if I need to, if I need money, I, I, you know, the thing with music gear, if you buy good stuff, you can always sell it. Yes. Right? It always holds, it really does hold value if you buy the right stuff. Um, okay. So anyway, my probably my the best the one guitar that i would hang on to out of all of them is i have a it's a les paul custom shop a 58 reissue that i bought i bought it new um in probably 2013 i think and it was just like i I came into the local store and i saw it i played it and after about 30 seconds i was like i have to have this those things are really expensive but i traded a bunch of guitars and financed part of it and stuff and it and it's um it, I don't know if you've played a lot of those things, but they're they're they are amazing. Like it really is. Like 
And I was I had a I had an American made Les Paul before, which I thought was cool, but the custom shop one just fucking is like so much better on all levels. And um, are you, you are you a big it. guy? Because I've played that, and I'm, I'm like my hands are average size, so I just struggle yeah. on those big necks. Yeah, no, I'm 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 not a big guy. My hands are kind of small, but I I do like the feel of the big neck. It mm. kind of it really works, and it's and it's also super stable. So when I play that guitar, I can play it all night at a show. Never really have to tune it. That's great. Does yes. that guy? Does yeah. your local store? He's got to have a wing named after you at yeah. this point, no? Oh yeah, no, they they uh, they yeah, they love me. I'm a preferred customer. I feel <laughs> a little. It's a little weird. It's a little. You know, I feel a little like. Uh, embarrassed by it i guess but what are you, you going to do you going to do um so yeah anyway so that um so you get Les Paul custom shop 2013 58 reissue that's your number 1 that's right that's my number 1 and then um i have a i have a strat like a sunburst strat like a 1954 reissue um which is cool. And to me, it's like those are like the two sort of the alpha and omega of guitar designs really yeah, the holy like grail man you're two different the sort of like that's the full spectrum of the sort of standard electric guitar sounds is fender gibson stuff and particularly the les paul and the strat so i use that strat too and and um again those are amazing guitars they're a little bit like for playing hard rock i, I would say it takes a little bit more effort but you can get like more crazy shit out of them probably does that, um, so does i got it, that the yeah, strat is, is that a um you have a maple neck or a rosewood it's a maple neck. When you're primarily a, a Gibson or humbucker style yes. player, right? Do you? Yes. Because I, I don't like maple necks, and I, that's why I love. I have a hard yeah. time with maple necks. Just curious. Yeah, I know what you mean. The one that and the, and the thing is with Strats is I've like when when we started Lachinga, I actually like the first practice I bought a Strat, and I just bought this like Strat copy that I was really into. Um, and it just, they, it kind of has this, they kind of have this like, well, you know, they have this sort of like wiry kind of like biting sound, right. Which is almost like more aggressive somewhat. Like you have to really play them hard to get it out of them, but they can kind of sound more aggressive and more kind of like mean than Gibson's in some ways. But anyway, the one that I, and I, and the thing is, is I've traded strats. Like I had that strat and I traded like a bunch of times and I get a new one and I'd be like, yeah, I'd like it for a while. And then eventually there'd be something about it. I'd be like, uh, anyway, so I, you know, so I get one and I'd be like, yeah, it's cool. But it's like, I'm not really crazy about the neck. It's too thin or like, you know, I'd play it for a few months and be like, yeah, it's not quite this. And then I got this one now and it seems to be the perfect combination pickups. Now. I mean, there's all so much variety in those guitars. You can, you know, um, and it's a maple neck, but it's all like worn down and stuff. So oh, no it's relics. on it. Yeah, so there's no finish on it. Uh, okay, yeah, so, I, and that makes a massive difference. Huge. Right? When those when those necks have that finish on it, it's like they're kind of almost unplayable. It's like super sticky, and and it's sort of like, but when it doesn't, it's like totally nice. To play, yeah, so. that's how I, I feel. So, but, I like the yeah. tactile. I like a dark wood. Yeah. You know, I have. Yeah, yeah. I've been playing this one. This is like ebony. I don't know if you can see this. If it's oh yeah, kind of yeah, that's cool. I love. Yeah, it. super it cool. Just feels so good. This. I wish everything was ebony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally yeah totally but they're they're kind of funny that way right it's like when you first start playing you're just like you're, you're happy to get like anything that's like a you know a gibson or a fender or something mm. that's like this is a quality guitar but after a while you start to notice like there's a huge variety within like each kind of design and you start to get more sort of your taste becomes more attuned to like what really works for you and what doesn't it's like it's like dating. I don't mean that in the yeah. sexist way. I mean like, you know, you first no. start dating, you're just like so happy that someone wants to go out with you. <laughs> sure. You know. Yeah, to totally, right? And then you're like, wait a minute, this works, that doesn't work, you know, yeah. So I, yes. I think anything you probably get into. Yes. Yeah, yeah like you that. start your taste your sort of taste and like your experience of it becomes more and more refined and it's sort of like you start I mean, it's like with guitar shit. I mean, it's like you, you get into it. And it's like no one else can tell the fucking difference, right? Like no one else even listening, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. They're like maybe, but but you know, as a feel thing, as a player, yeah. like it, it can make a difference. Huge, you know? huge. Yeah, yeah. Sure. sure. All right. So you got the fifty-eight custom Les Paul, yeah. the fifty-four Sunburst Strat reissue. What would be number three? Um. Oh, that's a that's a toss-up. I've got a bunch of different uh, cool Gibsons that I really really love. I think probably I've got a I've got a like a flying V reissue, um, 
which is like a 50s flying v reissue which is super cool guitar is that That's heavy a lot of fun. no it's super light wow it's super, okay yeah it's like it's like I don't even know how heavy it would be. Maybe six pounds. Oh, maybe? that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's like the bodies on those things are thinner, and it's got sort of really great like low pickup. So, and it has this, the, those guitars have like an awesome mid range, like a total vocal kind of sound. It's super fun and totally, totally cool. So is that would be, that would maybe be number three. Is it hard to play with a shape like that? You think it would be, but it's totally not. It's, it's not. totally not actually. In some ways, it's like more ergonomic than the Les Paul. It's really weird, but the but, neck is totally like you can go all the way up the neck, no problem. It's balanced when you hang it on your body. Like it totally is not neck heavy or anything. Not it's like sitting. an SG. I love my SG, but that is that's it takes yeah. some getting used to because the neck's heavier than the body. That's that's right. That's right. It's not like that at all. It's totally balanced. Like it'll stay. It'll stay perfectly, you know, level if you let go of it. It just hangs. So. Those that guitar and the and the Gibson Explorer, same thing. Like you think they're kind of awkward, but they actually are like they're super comfortable. It's weird. Yeah. Very cool, man. And yeah. um, for wah distortion and overdrive, what are your primary pedals for those three effects? So okay, so um, I really am like an amp overdrive guy. So I like I get most of the overdrive tones that I use is is. 90% of it will be guitar through amp. So it's just, and, and I like, I like almost, I prefer like non master volume amps. So just like a crank amp, yep. right? Over, overdrive the output tubes. And then I'll use like, um, I don't know, I go through different clean booths. I used a tube screamer for a long time. Right now I'm using a way huge uh, pork loin. It's a mm. purple one, which is, they're really cool pedals. That's a really fat. It's still like a, it, you know, I just use it as a clean boost. I basically just crank the, the volume on it, the output on it, right? So that yep. it just, push, just pushes the amp a bit more. Um, so I use that right now. And um, the wah, I, I just got this uh, wah by this company called Mission Audio. Do you know that? No. Mission Audio. They make a wah. It was kind of expensive, but it's really nice. It's really good sounding, really like tons of clarity and stuff. And so I'm using that right now. Is it the opt? Do you like the optical waz where you don't have to kick it to engage? Where as soon as you step down, or you're no, old school? I kind of like the old school ones. Yeah. Like I've got a, I've got a few different wah pedals. Like I was saying earlier, yeah. right? That's the one I'm using right now. I, I had the custom audio electronics, which is super cool as well. And then the, um, and then like the vintage uh, Gen 60s Crybaby, which is. Probably when when you plug it in, it's like, oh yeah, that's what a wah sounds like because that's the original sound, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're they're fun. I I kind of like I don't I use them a lot, right? So I get really kind of like into different ones and uh, you know like to trade it up sometimes, you know. Very cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Do, what, do you remember the first record or CD? Well, you'd be probably records that you purchased. Um. Well, you lived on that island. It was probably just stuff all around all the time, but music. Yeah, there was a lot of music around. Like, my dad had a massive record collection. It was almost all classical music, but he did have Beatles records. And I listened to I listened to those all the time when I was a kid. Um, so the first kind of connection I had with it, he had the – it was the Beatles' second album. Um, I had a huge connection with that record when I was a child. I remember I'd listen to it all, all the time and look at the pictures, right? There's all the pictures on the back, and it would yeah. be them with their haircuts and their suits. And then you see all the amps and the guitars and – so I remember looking at those, and I remember looking at uh, – there's one of the record, the Magical Mystery Tour record, and there's a picture in there. It's George Harrison. He's playing a, he's playing a Strat, and I'd never seen one. And I remember looking at it going, like, that's, like, the coolest-looking thing, like, the, the way that it was shaped. I remember just, like, looking at it going, like, that's so fucking cool-looking. Mm. What is that, you know? So I always had that kind of fascination with the music and the guitars and the musicians and stuff when I was little. Um, cool. As far as like buying a record, I don't really, jeez, I don't really know. I think I bought a Duran Duran record once when I was a kid. I got Rio. Or 
coming. Yeah, I got Rio, which is really it's a cool record, man. It's some great songs on that, man. Yeah, it's like so good. You know, Hungry Like the Wolf. I remember that yep. one. Yeah, that's um, funny, man. Van Halen's 1984. Great. Record. There was that whole period when I was a little kid, and that, that was like mid, like early mid 80s or whatever. And those are kind of like the big records. Mm. Van Halen's 1984. I remember that being like a huge thing. That was a huge thing. And uh, uh, Michael Jackson was a huge thing then, too. I remember Thriller. Everyone had a cassette copy of Thriller at some yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> Desert Island Discs, man. What would be your top ones? Oh, God. Um, okay. Rolling Stones, Exile on Main Street mm-hmm. is just a start to finish. Everything about that record. Love that. You know, I can still I can listen to it almost in any mood at any time. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mick Taylor was on that, correct? Yeah, yeah Mick that, Taylor. Yeah. That's I find that's for me. That's the my favorite era of the Stones. Oh. I think the work he did with them far and away. Yeah, far and away. I mean, I I love the Rolling Stones, but it's really like you could take that era, the sort of sixty eight to seventy two. That's all. I, that's all I really really want to listen to. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of like they had other great moments and stuff, but I didn't really, not really a fan of their sort of. Um, uh, you know, their early kind of like British invasion garage rock stuff. I think they were way better bands at the time. Um, and then they kind of became sort of more of like a sort of a cocaine band. Kind of oh, he on. was just amazing yeah, what he like, did. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that period is they're, they're incredible albums. So that would totally be one. Um, I find that I, there's, I mean, there's a lot of really good double albums. I'm, I'm a big uh, Springsteen fan. I love the album, the river. Mm-hmm. That's another kind of big sprawling record that has tons of moods and it, it, you know, like there's like, there's so much on that, that it's sort of like, if you had to take one kind of great record, that would, that could, that would be a contender, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we'll just go upstairs here for a second. And I'll, show, I'll, show, <laughs> I'll show you. Do you still listen to vinyl? You. Cause I have vinyl, uh, but I never well, listened to it. Yeah, really. I do. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Wow. You got a nice collection. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it goes forever. Oh <laughs> wow, wow, <laughs> so, wow! I, I don't know. I, I'd be. I'd really have to. I hope I never get in a scenario where I have to go to a desert island and take just one. Yeah, record. It'd be hard pressed, right? I did a purge about like a year ago. I probably had, I don't know, a couple of thousand, and I got rid no. of like half just because, like, I, yeah. space. It was just out of control. Yeah, I mean, I could certainly do that. I have a lot of great records, but there's also a lot of like sort of value village type, you know, right. Like I don't need like a Chris, Chris, you know, the sort of greatest hits of Chris Christopherson or, yeah, right. you know, like, like, a, you know, <clears throat> especially like if you ever have to like move house a couple of times or something like that, <laughs> that's what happened. We moved. I'm like, I'm yeah. never doing yeah. this shit again. This was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just like can't a, keep carrying shit around. I'm not using <laughs> moving a box of boat anchors, you know, a hundred percent, man. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, totally. 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, ben, what's the most important things that you've learned about yourself through career experience and life in general? Um, wow. I would say, okay, this is a, that's a big question, right? Um, I think what, I, what I've learned about myself over time is to just like, I just have stopped worrying about stuff and stopped taking things so seriously and personally, you know, and that can be like in life in general or my music career or any other aspect of life. It's just sort of like, um, you know, it's like one of those things where it's sort of like what other people think of me is none of my business basically, you know? Yeah, man. And it's like, I just need to relax and let go and just like do my thing and enjoy my day, you know? And, and just all the other stuff, you know, the expectations or what happens or what people think or uh, like all that. I just like, I let go of that stuff. Right. What you just said, that line that I want to say that out loud, because I think a lot of people struggle with that. And the way you just put it makes it real easy. I think for people to get rid of that shit. You said what other people think of me is none of my business. Yeah. And that like takes all the weight off. Totally. Right. Yeah, totally. 
so that's like for me it's like uh, now i try to live i try to live that as much as i can now Mm. that's really can be a tall order sometimes you know but um when i i know when i'm living in that it's sort of like yeah man life is really good like yeah like great happen and life is easy and i can really enjoy what i'm doing as opposed to like constantly be thinking about you know how things should be or what I should be feeling or doing or whatever. Right? That's too much. That's too yeah, much no, work. It's too, that's, too much. that's a that's job, much man. Work. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, yeah. I can't do that. And it's none of my business. No. Too, you know, it's like, no. So absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, you got another kid on, you now. I do. There you go. Hey, my how are you? <laughs> Lucy. you? You got a cool dad. Yeah. Yeah. He's um, all right. <laughs> definition of happiness. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, again, it would be definition of happiness is just like living in the moment, you know, Mm. that's what it is for me being one, you know, being entirely being a hundred percent present. So do you have any, uh, non-musical superpowers? Non-musical. Do I, sweetie, do you think I have any non-musical superpowers? What does that mean? Like, am I really good at something that's not guitar? She's, you're good at piano. I'm good at piano. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> um, that was I, cute. You know, man. I do. I I have another. I have another career. Like I'm a I'm a builder, right? So very I, cool, I, man. Yeah. So I've worked as a like a construction manager. So, what do you can, build? Like residential homes, I, or yeah, residential homes. Mainly rentals, so I I can build I can rental someone's house. That's and awesome. Make a and and really do a great job of it. So I don't know if that's a superpower, but it's certainly a skill. Well, I'll tell you what, man. You yeah. got up and walked around. You got some very nice clean lines in your own house, there, man. So oh looks yeah, great. yeah, yeah. No, it's it's lovely. Yeah. yeah, this is the and I did do a renovation of this house when we moved in. Yeah. Mild one. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great, man. That's very cool. Yeah. Has uh has life been different? Has your life been different than what you imagined? Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, and better, you know, that's the, that's the key right there, you know, totally like different than I could have possibly imagined. And also like better, you know, I mean, I had sort of dreams and aspirations when I was a, you know, a teenager or a youth, but they were sort of like, like kind of sort of like more like ego driven and (laughs) kind of silly and like, you know what I mean? Just like, but it's good that you let go of, um, you know, earlier on you said, <clears throat> I stop, you know, I stop when I started playing music for the purity of it, not, uh, for the, to be a rock star sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I yeah, think, totally. yeah, yeah. It just, and it like what I was saying, like, it just kind of ties into that whole thing of like, I can recall like, you know, like nowadays, like I generally like, you know, sometimes it's a slog to like, you know, move the gear and go and, you know, do gigs and, you know, and like, you know, that kind of stuff. But I generally like, I'm, I'm like super, like I super enjoy doing it. Like mm. I have a great time and I'm like, and it's sort of like, I'm, I'm not so like interested in like, well, how many people are there and who's there and like, what is, you know, it's like, it's, I don't really care. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> like going there to play want, music and whatever will be, will be. Totally. Like, and again, it's like all that kind of stuff is really like, it's beyond my control. Right. It's like totally whoever's right. going to be there is going to be there. And it's like, it doesn't really, it's none of my business. It doesn't really matter. It's like, I'm just going to go there and I'm going to do my thing and like embrace it a hundred percent when I'm doing it, you know? Very cool. Yeah. Hey, what's, yeah. what's the best money you ever spent on something? Oh God, it's gotta be that guitar that I bought. That one that I was telling you. About. Oh, the double neck. Uh, no, I think probably the, the, the custom. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what, I mean, there's other, you know, this like I thought. Well, I bought this house, right? That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> but certainly, like for me, like a like a personal item like that, yeah, for sure. That custom. was like one of those things where it was like it was tons of money, but I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go for this. Man. It also kind of like it sort of like. Um, it also made mom really angry. Yeah, it did. It, it also made cuddle. mommy really angry. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting the, we're getting everybody's spilling the beans here, Ben. Yeah, totally. Listen oh to me God. and then get the truth. Yeah, get the reality it also made here. mommy really angry. Yeah, that's, that's classic. <laughs> oh boy, that's a, that's um, great. That's so funny. But you know, what I, I, what I was saying 
was that uh, when you, you know, just like, it just made, it just like, I was making a commitment because I kind of hummed and hawed over it. And it was like, you know what? No, I, I love doing this. This is what I've always loved doing. And it's like, if I don't deserve this kind of guitar, then, then who does? You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like making a commitment to, you know, yeah. well, I'm not saying you have to spend money to prove that or whatever, but for me, it was just kind of like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this because I want this thing. Yeah. Hey, sweetie. Yeah. Hey, you have any hobbies outside of music? Um, let's see here. Jeez, oh, I must. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of something. It's I, I. You know what, man? You got three kids. It's tough yeah. to find, and I, you and, know, a, and I, you're running I, a business. I, I like um, I like uh, long distance running, so I run. I go. That's running. awesome, man. Yeah, so I really like that. That's like totally. I don't know if you call it a hobby, but it's sort of like a like a relaxing kind of thing and a fitness thing. That's great. But I like that. I've had some other. I used to really be into motorcycles. I don't own a motorcycle now, um, but that's something that I really love too. Yeah. Um, two more questions, man. Yeah. Most <laughs> the t- toughest decision you ever had to make or hardest or most difficult thing you ever had to do. Oh, wow. Um, geez. Let's see here. Oh, that's tough. Well, you know what? The reality of it is, is my mom passed away maybe a year and a half ago. Sorry, man. Yeah. Yeah. Which was Real really sorry. tough. And, uh, and, uh, it was like, I had this like horrible, uh, uh, like basically like all like falling out with one of my brother, with my brother. And, uh, I had to make some really hard decisions about my mom's, like her estate you know, and, and what to do with that kind of stuff. And, uh, that was like really challenging, you know, um, she, you know, she, she owned a, we had to, we had to sell some real estate basically. And me and my brother were at a disagreement with it. And I had to, I we had to like, just make some decisions about it basically to, to resolve things. Right. And that was awful. It's just an awful, awful time and a very difficult thing to do. And I, know that I made the right decision about it, but it just didn't make it easy or pleasant or anything, you know? Sorry, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, these are the things that it's just, this is just life. You yeah, know what I mean? I know, it's man. Of, it's just like, it's like you can't, you can't avoid. It's just like, you know, as much as you can feel good and there's wonderful things and success, there's also like people die and you have fights and you have disagreements, yeah. you have problems that are like, you know, the, the solutions aren't obvious. You know what I mean? And, the right thing to do is not the easy thing to do. And so there was that, um, certainly when I got sober, that yeah. was like, that was really hard too. you know, again, it was sort of like, um, <clears throat> making the decision to stop when I reached the point that I was in so much pain, like that was easy, but like trying to learn how to live without, uh, using drugs and without drinking, that was really challenging for the first little while, mm-hmm. you know? It really was, if you've ever talked to anyone in recovery, they talk about the one day at a time scenario and it, it really becomes like that because it's sort of like, it's really hard to imagine functioning without, you know. Any kind sure. Of, yeah, of course. Like, so, and it's also just like, you know, I came from a, you know, my whole adolescence, my early twenties, it was like, that's how I lived. That's how I dealt with everything. Like, it was like, I didn't do anything unless I was stoned or drunk or whatever. And then it's like, you have to, I had to learn how to do everything again. Basically. Yeah. Which is like super humbling and really, really challenging. It's almost like um, being a baby. Oh, it totally is, right? And you meet yeah. people, you meet people in recovery where it's sort of like, and you kind of realize it's like, wow, it's like your development kind of stops. Your well, development as a human being stopped when you started serious, like he- using drugs heavily, yeah. right? And then you're, you, you know, you might be like forty or something, but really, it's like you're really like an eighteen year old, hmm. you know. And you have to kind of start from emotionally, you know? Yes. So that was, that was totally my experience, right? It was like, yeah, like, <laughs> I had to like learn how to like pay phone bills and have a bank account and like do all these kind of adults, you know, just that kind of stuff. I never learned how to do it. Yeah, you know, I never, I, I was like completely like not involved in regular society at all when I got sober. So. Man, well, you did that real successfully. You got a business now. And so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, no, it, it's all worked out 
amazingly and it's but it's certainly like just like one baby step at a time to like learn how to do that kind of stuff you know it's uh yeah i think there's a lot of wisdom in the in the program though for like a lot of things that go beyond getting sober like just like taking things one day at a time like oh boy. god like that yeah. is like a lot easier than worrying about what's going to happen next thursday Oh, to oh, totally. <laughs> oh, totally. And the thing is, for me too is like it's kind of crucial because if I if I'm like left to my own devices, I'll like worry myself. I'll can, I'll talk myself out of doing things yeah. that I want to do because I think I can like look into the future and like imagine. <laughs> I'm how not laughing at you. I'm laughing because I understand you. <laughs> yeah, it's all going to blow up in my face, so I better not do this thing because this is probably how it's going to turn out. But I know. Reality, and this this guy's going to yeah. say this, and this person's oh, totally, and and right? and, and, and like, then you. I, yeah, you got to be like, wait a minute, like I, <laughs> I can't like see into the future. Right. You know what I mean? Like, no one can, right? right? And it never it's happens. Like, Any, I don't know, never, like yeah. literally, almost never. No, happens. no, no. You imagine, I yeah. can imagine all this horrible shit yeah. happening, and it's like it, it never works out that way, right? Yeah. It's like I, I cannot predict the future, and like I can't, you know. So, so yeah, no, certainly, like, and recovery is like that if you're. Um, if you're in it for a while, it's like the first part of it is like it gets you sober. And then the rest of it, the real part of it is like it teaches you like how to live. Coping you know? skills. Yes. Yeah. It teaches you how to sort of get, you know, sort of shed some of that bullshit. You yeah. know what I mean? The sort of mental kind of gymnastics that that keep us kind of crazy, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's been a massive part of my life, right? Yeah. I'm happy for you, man. It's funny. I, yeah. I've talked to a lot of guys and, you know, guys like yourself that have been sober a long time and they still go to meetings and stuff. And I remember oh, one, yeah. one guy said, he goes, Hey man, and they'll go to meetings. Like, you know, these are traveling musicians, a lot of them. And they're like, Hey, yeah. I was, ma I always managed to find a dope man wherever I went. I could find a meeting. Well, that's it. Totally. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. It's like, I, I would do, you know, tie myself in knots. I would do like, like walk through the, you know, walk through the you know the rings of hell to like get dope right you know what I mean? but it's like i'm sure i can show up at an aa meeting once in a while yeah <laughs> right right you just like, go online and it's like a list yeah it's just not really that hard yeah you know? Well, I'm I'm really happy for you, man. You've done great, honestly. You oh, don't need me to tell you that, but I'm happy for you, though. No, thanks. I really appreciate that. I mean, you kind of answered this one. I was going to ask you, what's the biggest change in your personality over the last ten years? Yeah, I think what I was talking about before is like just like letting go, letting of, go, like, yeah. worry and self doubt and being critical of self and others, and just sort of like just letting go of all those kinds of ideas and stories and all that nonsense, and just sort of embracing the moment and what I'm doing now and without any kind of like judgment or like idea about it, meaning this or that, you know? And I find if I'm like living in that, it's like, I can really, really enjoy life and like be, be the best at whatever I'm doing in the moment, you know? Very cool. And speaking of yeah. being the best, you are like just a great guitar player and I'm not blowing oh, smoke fine. up your ass. And I just want to tell everybody, please check out Ben and check out La Chinga. Um, just a great, Ben and Ben's a really cool player. Um, let me just tell you where you could find these guys. First of all, they're going to Europe in August, so all my listeners, check them out. They're going to be uh, how many? Do you know? Like, do you have it booked out yet, or do you know where you're going to uh, be? It's, it's in the process of being booked. It's going to be about three weeks, and it'll be all over. That's great. So it, yeah, totally. We promote all our stuff through our Facebook page, so that's where to see it. Great. It's Facebook.com. Yeah. Is it Facebook? La Chinga. L-A-C-H-I-N-G. Yeah. Great. That's right. Yeah. Go to La Chinga on Facebook and you can see where they're going to be. If you're in Europe, check them out. Um, they've got a great YouTube channel. It's La Chinga Band. And again, La Chinga is La L-A-C-H-I-N-G-A. So check out La Chinga Band. Um, now you're going to be at South by Southwest, but the other guys are not? No, no. The whole band. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. So, La Chinga, yeah. Great. And so yeah, they're all going to be a showcase gig on the, it's the Wednesday, the 13th. I don't really have the info in front of me, but again, if you're going to be there and you want to check us out, check out our Facebook thing. We'll be promoting awesome. it. There. Yes. Very yeah. cool. So they will be at South by Southwest and they yeah. will also be at the 420 festival in Calgary. That's right. And we're going to play in um, Dallas at the same time as South by Southwest in, in March uh, with Wolf Bat. I don't know if you know those guys. No. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'll check them out. Though. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and also check out their three records. 
2013 self-titled album La Chinga, 2016 Freewheeling with one of my all-time favorite songs on it, um, Dawn of Man, which is just a great song if you want to like lay back and just get your mind blown up for 10 minutes check that out and their new record beyond the sky which has got some great riffs on there man i can't thank you enough i really appreciate your patience yeah. and you know Dude, getting together uh, yeah my, my pleasure I'm, I'm totally happy to talk talk about this kind of stuff super super great and i totally appreciate it man thank you man everybody yeah. please check out ben yardley and and check out la chinga and um Thank you, man. Was, I really appreciate you being so real and, uh, right and, and with your kids there. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate your daughter being so real as well. Life, man. Life right there. Exactly. <laughs> Mommy was very angry. That, <laughs> that is very like. The, Daddy bought another guitar home. <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> so funny. Every, everybody. So true. I mean, that was, that was classic, man. Yeah, yeah. Fine. Everybody, thank Definitely. you for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Ben Yardley for spending time with us. Please check out La Chinga. Great band. Ben is just a great riffage machine, and um, I know you're going to love him. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, you'll know this one. Remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be <laughs> nice, right? Right on. That's where I got that from, man, uh, yeah, from yeah. some uh, meeting literature. Yeah, um, yeah. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.